Matthew chapter 18, and we'll start at verse number 19. When you get there, please stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus said, Again, I say unto you. So apparently this wasn't the first time that Jesus was trying to make this point to the disciples and to you and I today. That if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be. I don't know where you come from, but where I come from, it shall be means it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for your holy written word. We thank you, Lord God, that you are holy and we can stand in the beauty of your holiness. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that you made us and we, not ourselves. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that as we give heed to your word, our minds can be renewed, our bodies can be transformed to, to be that of healed. We don't have to be depressed or stressed and deal with anxiety. We know many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you are the God that delivereth out of them all. Now, Father, I pray that every affliction and all of oppression be left in this place. We send it back from the adversary from which it comes in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Holy Ghost of God, we ask you now to come and take authority in this service. We pray for the children to be attentive. We pray for the babes to be attentive. We pray for the Facebook to crash. We, we pray for no internet service in this place. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and the church said Amen. This morning I want to I want to preach to you on a subject, quite simple, I want to talk to you about pot. Probably not, not, not pot is, but what I'm going to show you this morning will take you to a higher plane, a, a higher level, a higher walk with God, if you will. Oh, I'm not talking about pot as in many people think, but Pot is an acronym for the power of two. See, not only was Jesus, but Jesus was just confirming the Bible says that out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And the scripture gives us that two and three witnesses at least on this very subject of two or three. Now let me tell you something. I've said this many times, and but I think it's worthy to be said again. I know many people use this from Jesus' lips that where two or three are gathered together in his name. They use that as a cop-out to not assembly in the house of God because they say, well, we can have church uh, on, on the fishing boat. And we can talk about Jesus around our... You should be talking about Jesus on the fishing boat around the kitchen table riding your four wheelers riding your horses I mean you should be talking if you're a child of God really what else do you and I got to talk about can you say amen this is not a constitution for church I'm sorry well the Bible said yes I know it says where two or three are gathered together in his name, in his name, there he is in the midst. But I can tell you something this morning. If nobody showed up in this building, he's still in the midst. He, but he's not, he's not confound to this building. I'm telling you, he was in the midst of my vehicle this morning. He was in the midst of my bathroom. Come on now. By myself. But there's a principle here. As a matter of fact, I'll go on to own uh, further to say this two or three if you read. See, when you get in trouble, when you take one verse and try to make a doctrine or make a point out of it, it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And well, actually what is going on here with these two or three witnesses is trying to restore someone who has gotten out of the fellowship. You go to them if they don't receive you. You take two or three more witnesses with you to try to restore such a one that has fallen. 
It is not church. But the principle of, of the power of two is all through the Scripture. Really, this is part two. I'm, I'm not a sermon series type preacher, but sometimes you got to hammer on the same point till, the, till you get it. Amen. I got one amen. So this is kind of part two, if you will, from last week. A Amos 3 and 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now that also includes your home. For you that are married, you and your spouse need to get an agreement. Get an agreement on how your kids are going to be raised. Get an agreement on how you're going to discipline your kids, how you're going to spend your money. Amen. Good preaching, brother kid. I amen my own self. You better get an agreement. And when it comes to the house of God, the church should be in agreement on the mission and the vision of the local assembly. Amen. You need a prayer partner because there's power in two. Amen. You need to be accountable to somebody. Amen. Ecclesiastes, which was written by Sol Solomon, which was one of the uh, the most he asked for wisdom and probably the smartest man for from not born a born of natural woman that that ever lived. And he said, two are better than one." Why? Because they have a good reward for their labor. Can you say amen? Now many of you are like myself. You've worked a lot by yourself and you learn to do things that would naturally be a two or three man type job, but you learn to do it by yourself. But that is still not God's principle and it's still not God's plan. God wants the people of God to be in order. They want them to be in agreement for his kingdom be established on the earth. There is a common theme through the book of Acts. We're Pentecostal people and we love to talk about the book of Acts. And the, because, and, but it, no matter whether you're Pentecostal or not. If whatever your brand may be that you put on yourself. You should love the book of Acts. Because it shows the birth of the Lord's church. I'm going to say that again loud and clear. The Lord's church. And a common theme through the scripture, and this will be more like a teaching this morning than, than maybe so preaching, if you will. But they had their common phrase was one accord. The vision in the early church was uncommon, and if it rose its ugly head, it was dealt with quickly. The very birth of the church, if you will, was birthed from the believers in an upper room in one accord and prayer and supplication. The church, the local church, this local church, and the church as a whole must come together in prayer and supplication. Now listen, I, I make no apology for what I'm about to say. I, I, and I know this will be on the air, you know. And t tomorrow night, there's there's a young child in, in the mother's womb that's got some serious uh, medical conditions. And we know the Bible makes it clear that one can put a thousand in flight and two can put ten thousand. And and so the numbers go and go and go. So, but I'm going to tell you something. Be careful who you let pray for you. Some people will pray you right into the grave. Can you say amen? I remember a couple years ago or a year or so ago, uh, what was asked, it was a, it was a, it was a friend, uh, of brand is a close friend whose father ha had cancer. And they asked, would, would we come and pray? And my, my immediate response is, who's going to be there? And you think, well, that's, why would you ask that? Because I want to know what I'm walking into. When a man or a woman or a person's life is on the line, I don't want to be in a room full of people that have unbelief and doubt in their hearts. And so we went and prayed. And, and there they gathered around and, and many 
no doubt, I mean, these people love Jesus. They ain't a doubt in my mind. They love God. No doubt they were born again. And they begin to pray for this man. And the minute they said, God, if it's your will, I pulled my hand off and I walked away. And I said within myself, this man will be dead within a week. He died two days later. If you're going to get somebody to pray for you, you better know what they believe before you let them pray for you. And I make no apologies for saying that. Can you say amen? And I thought the same thing about this child. There is a power. Jesus said if two, you don't need a large prayer group. You need one person to agree with you in prayer. Could you imagine if you got a hundred or a thousand to be in total agreement as to what you're praying? So the church, the church was birthed out of this one accord in prayer and supplication, and I, I with the women. Thank God that that this that this uh, believer, this core group of believers, they do not suppress the women, but they allow the women to walk in the callings and gifting that God has placed upon them. And that's in Acts chapter 1. We're just going to go through the book of Acts. And then we flip over your, flip over your page and you're in Acts chapter 2. And, it, and, and they stayed there uh, probably about 10 days. Jesus walked there for 40 days before he ascended. He said, go to Jerusalem and tarry and wait until the promise has come. So they go to Jerusalem, they're in the upper room, they're in one accord with the women. 500 was told, about 120 showed up. That sounds like today. Can you say amen? 500 get told and about 120 show up. And so they're there for about, well, we're going to say roughly 10 days in one accord, praying. I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you want the Holy Ghost to fall once again in your services, it's going to be birthed, it's going to fall just like it did in Acts chapter 2. It's going to be a group of believers in prayer and one accord waiting for the move of God to come. This once again flopping in and flopping out. If all you want to do is just have a, a church form and deny the prayer, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you want the Holy Ghost to fall and breathe on men and women like He did on Pentecost, it's going to take one accord with prayer and supplication in the house of God. God, among the people of God. Can you say amen? We also read in Acts chapter 2, after this move of God, after the point of the Holy Ghost, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, breaking bread from house to house daily. They did these things. They didn't flop in on Sunday morning, come in late, and if you get here, I mean, they, they, they stayed and they communed and they broke bread and they fellowship from house to house with singleness of heart. It just wasn't on special events that they come together. It was a lifestyle that they lived. This one accord thing, it is how the church is to operate. If you can say we're one with the Father and the Father is one with us, it's the only way it can operate. There cannot be discord among the brethren because I'll tell you why. It's one of the seven things that God doeth hate. Yea, six things doeth God hate. Yea, seven is an abomination. Him that soweth discord among the brethren, that does God hate. Take that mess on up the road. Continued daily. There are seven days. There are seven days. There are seven days in a week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I don't know where you come from, but where I come from, there are seven days in a week. Daily means that. Every day. They continued in this one accord. So what happened when they left the temple? They didn't go talk about. Well, I don't really like. I really didn't. I don't. I just don't really like how things are going at the church. I, I just really don't like this music we're singing these days. I, I really. I just don't like this, and I don't like how they're doing this, and and I just. 
It was an issue that was brought before the body of believers. And they dealt with it as a body of believers. As a body. And then Acts chapter 3. We see that Peter and John went to the temple to do what? To pray. Together. Because two are stronger than one. And so Peter and John, now listen, these men were full of the Holy Ghost. I mean, my God, they could have went to the temple all by themselves. But they knew the principle of what Jesus said, if two shall agree on earth is touching anything, they ask the Father, He's going to do it. So now here they come into the temple, and here lays this lame man. Could you imagine if there was discord and dysfunction and disloyalty with Peter and John as going into the temple? That man would have stayed there dead on his feet. Can you say Amen. But because they went to the house of God together and one accord, this lame man come to his feet. Can you say together? The Bible says in Acts 3 and 1, went up together into the temple of the hour of prayer. Now my God, who would not like to see the lame walk again? But don't expect the lame to walk again in your presence. It'll be something you read about. It'll be something you see on Facebook and other people's ministry. Until the day that the body of Christ comes in one accord in agreement in prayer, you're only going to hear about others walking. And don't expect the lame to walk here when you can't stand... When you can't stand to your feet yourself. When you can't stand on the gospel. When you can't stand to worship. When you can't stand to pray. When you don't expect the lame will walk when you won't stand yourself. It'll just be fairy tales in your world until we walk in one accord, one to another. And you know the story the man comes up. He gets up, he goes into the house leaping and praising and magnifying God. He didn't have to have a move of God to get him stirred. He didn't have to have his favorite singer to get him stirred. My God, God got him stirred and he went into the house of God leaping and dancing and praising and magnifying God. And here all the people, let me tell you something, watch this. All the people begin to gather around and they said, oh, that they were looking at them. And they said, don't look on us as we've done this to this man, but it's by the man named Jesus. Two together in his name. The lame will walk when two or more will come together in his name. And the result of that, 5,000, count them, 5,000 people were born again that day because two men in one accord Went to the temple to pray. I'm going to tell you something, and I don't got nothing to back this up, but I, I, I believe I'd be right. Hart County ain't seen a 5,000 people say in the last 10 years. Maybe it could go 25. Because there's no accord. Oh, we can come together. We can come together on a little Thanksgiving services. We can come together this afternoon. At, at the at the far house and saying carols and that's all great and fine I'm on for it I'll be there if that don't happen between now and then but I'm gonna tell you there's still discord because you watch Methodists will all be singing together then the Baptists will be over here in their little section I mean come on don't tell me they ain't discord get real with yourself well how many more songs they gonna sing yeah, that was said on uh, Thanksgiving. How many more songs are they going to sing? What's it matter? Get in there with them. My God, give me a break. And so now, now they get in trouble. They preach it. So they brought before the, the council and they said, we don't want you preaching no more in the name of Jesus. And they said, well, I'm paraphrasing. But basically they said, well, we're sorry about your luck. You can want one hand and wish another and see which one fills up the quickest. But we can't help 
but tell and preach about this man named Jesus. And so they whipped them, they roughed them up a little bit and, and sent them on their way. It's like, well, sure, this will take care of it. And guess what they do? They go back to the church with a bunch of believers and they begin to pray and say, God, you hear their threatness. You see what they're doing. The Bible says they will speak the word with boldness. And here they're praying. Oh God, give us boldness to speak your word. My God. I mean, they look right in the face of people that could have put them to death and said, we're not stopping. You do, do your best. But we're not stopping preaching this Jesus. And they go back and pray for more boldness. And my God, the Bible says when they, when they prayed, the house was shaken. If you want earth moving services again, you need to come here. Be in one accord with the vision. With with the ministry, and my God, there'll be earth shaking services again. They prayed in the place were shaken, where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You say, Well, I was filled with the Holy Ghost when I was 12. Sometimes you need a refill. My God. And in Acts chapter 5, after this, the Bible says in verse 12, and, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. If you got the right kind of Bible, in the parentheses it says, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. You want signs and wonders once again in your services? It starts with people being in one accord. God don't operate in discord. He don't operate in disunity. Come on now. I don't mean we got to agree everything doctrinally. Sound on, I mean, there's some things we cannot compromise. We can't compromise the virgin birth. We can't compromise you must be born again. We can't compromise living holy. Now, whether you believe Jesus is coming at pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, post-rap, that ain't, that's, that's something we can agree to disagree on. I'm still going to love I'm going to love them all. Can you say amen? The fact of the matter is, Jesus is coming. Can you say amen? But they were in one accord. They had no hidden agenda. They were like Ananias and Safari. That's where all this happened. They had a hidden agenda. And when the hidden agenda was dealt with, signs and wonders began to manifest again. For you that don't know about Ananias and Sapphira, let me help you out here just a minute. The Bible, the, the, the Bible I mean, you got, okay, let's just slow down here. Slow down, Dwayne, for a minute. Slow down. 3,000 get saved on Pentecost. A few days later, 5,000 people get saved. Now, on Pentecost, uh, they was all going to go home after this day, but they didn't go home. There was a revival that broke out in Jerusalem, and people got to eat and, and things. So they begin to sell everything they had. They brought it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed among this revival. And Ananias and Sapphira thought, hey, we'll get in on the game. We might get our name up on the church. We might get something dedicated in our name. So they go sell their property and they bring in the money. And Peter looks at him and says, he looks at Ananias, he comes in first. And he says, uh, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? It was your property, it was your money to do whatever you wanted with. But you come in here strutting like a baby rooster, acting like you give it all when you ain't. And now because you've done that, He fell dead. Men come in, took him out and buried him. Sometime later, same day, his wife comes in. Peter said, uh, did you sell the land for such and such? Yes, we did. He said, the same men that just buried your husband are outside the door. And she gave up the ghost. It's a dangerous thing to lie to the Holy Ghost. And then, once Ananias and Sapphira was dealt with, one accord began to take place and signs and wonders began to happen again. One accord will produce effective ministry. You ever, I mean, you ever feel like your ministry that God's called you to is just going nowhere? Now I understand you sow, you water, you sow, you water, then you got to wait for the increase. But, I mean, it don't take 20, 30 years to reap a harvest. Can you say amen? 
But being in one accord will produce effective ministry. You remember in Acts chapter 10, Peter was on the rooftop praying. They was fixing lunch downstairs. And he saw this vision of all these unclean beasts. You, most of you know the story. And the Spirit of God says, Rise, kill Peter and eat. And he said, No, not so, Lord. Nothing unclean or uncommon has ever come to my lips. And this happened three times. And about that time, and at Cornelius' house, which was a Gentile who had not heard about salvation, saw an angel said, I want you to send for Peter, and he's going to come and tell you words. Amen. I'm going to say this again. I'm going to keep hammering it home. This whole thing, well, you're the only Bible some people ever read. Just live it out in front of them. There ain't nobody ever going to get saved by you living it out in front of them. Can you say amen? Now, it may spark their interest. It may get their attention. But for them to get saved, they're going to have to hear the words of the gospel. So he, he comes down and here these men come. And he goes with them, doubting nothing. God said, don't go with them, doubting nothing. But Peter, in here in Acts chapter 10, the Bible says when they get to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius, he got everybody he could in his house. I mean, he, he wanted everybody to know about this salvation. And the Bible says that Peter took people with him. Jesus sent the 70 out two by two. And Peter took people with him. And in Acts chapter 11, we find out that he took six brethren with him because he was in a little hot water with the church at Jerusalem. He was in a little hot water with the Jews because he entered into the house of a Gentile, which was forbidden in the law. But being led of the Spirit and being one accord, you've got to imagine, these six brethren laid their neck, laid their reputation on the line for a man named Cornelius could be saved. They had faith and trust in what Peter saw. Yeah, I mean, I could just imagine the church today. Well, God didn't give me that word, Peter. You, you, you just gone by yourself. I, I, I didn't hear that from God. I, I just don't think that's the direction we need to go in. But Peter, I mean, bust, make a move if you want to. But, you know, we, we, we think we'll stay here. These six men took faith in the vision that Peter had and they went with Peter obeying the law and walked into this man Gentile's house and they Peter said and he began to preach and in Acts 10 38 he said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was and still is. And my God, He's with me and He's with you who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. I'm telling you this morning, when you get ah, when you get led by the Holy Ghost and come in one accord, you'll produce effective ministry. And to make a long story short, when they met before the, the, the council, they said, hey, you know, who are we for being? Let's just send this to them. Don't eat anything that's been strangled. Don't eat blood. And abstain from fornication. That was a law that was put upon the New Testament church. Don't eat anything strangled. Don't eat blood and abstain from fornication. Amen. I'm going to tell you this morning also, and we see when we are in one accord as a body of believers, death sentences can be overturned. And that makes me go back to that man. I'm going to tell you something. Cancer is a death sentence. Every person, they hear that word. If you ever hear that word, you have just been, by the medical science, been given a death sentence. But not by God. In Acts chapter 11, Peter, <laughs> you can't stop a man of God. You can do what you want. You ain't going to stop him. Here Peter was. Herod, Herod trying to show off a little bit. Done killed James. And he thought, man, if I get this Peter, I'm going to lock him up and I'm going to kill him. And man, I'm really going to stop this church business. I'm really going to stop this gospel. And so here, Peter is asleep. I mean, he's, he's sentenced to die the next day. They're going to take him out and kill him come Monday, or come morning. Tomorrow is, tomorrow is Monday, so that's why I said. They was going to kill him come tomorrow. 
And what's he doing? Asleep. And he done got comfortable too. He went to bed. How do I know he got comfortable? Because when the angel of the Lord had, had to smote him to give him, wake him up, he said, Peter, put your clothes on. I mean, God, he went to bed. He just didn't lay down and fall asleep. He went to, he went to bed and then went to sleep. Peter, get your clothes on. And you know why that angel showed up? Well, let me tell you something. Because in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, it says, while he was in prison, prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Herod didn't change his mind. But because you had a church that was believing and praying to God, this death sentence was overturned by God. Can you say amen? And then we find Peter as he's leaving. He finally, I mean, he thinks he's having a vision. And then he finally realizes, hey, this really happened. I'm out of prison. I think I'm going to go to the, go to the church house. And there he knocks on the door. And Rhoda answers the door. And she can't believe it. And she runs in and tells him, says, hey, he's here. They said, you're beside yourself, girl. No, it's him. It's for real. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, And when they had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. If two shall agree. There's people in here this room this morning. You may not have a, a physical death sentence. But if you don't get your depression in control, you've got a death sentence on you. If you don't get your anxiety under control, you've got a death sentence. If you don't get your addictions under control, you've got a death sentence over your head. Whether it be cigarettes, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be prescription drugs, many of you have got a death sentence over your head that needs to be overturned. And the only way it's going to overturn is when the people of God come together in one accord and pray. I'm preaching way better than you, amen, this morning. Many of you, suicides bounce around in your head. The devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And what better glory can he get if you do it yourself? But when God's people come together and pray, that death sentence can be overturned. Some of you have got death sentence this morning that you need to over, come overturned. And I'm going to tell you something, church. Commenting praying is not praying. And most of you that comment praying, you don't even pray. Straighten your halos up. I've been guilty of that, and so have you. Texting, praying, or even you know, getting a little emoji with the folding hands, that ain't praying. Praying is being in communion with God and holding back the forces of darkness over people's lives. The church will never have ministry direction. Until it comes in one accord. It's never. It's just going to be doing this. Well, we'll try this. We'll see if this works. We'll try this ministry. We'll see if this works. Well, this worked okay for this church. Let's try this and see if it works. And all you're doing is trying and failing. But when you come together in one accord and hear from God, the ministry direction that you get will be effective. Now, I didn't get the whole. I didn't get to see the whole thing last night. But if you get time today, or now, I many of you are going to be off Christmas. Y'all have all seen the Christmas story a million times. You've seen Rudolph a hundred of times. You've seen Santa Claus come to town. Uh, go find you somewhere. Probably You can probably find it on Netflix, Hulu, probably on some free channels. Go watch The Cross and the Switchblade. Yet, yet though he dead, he still speaketh. I'm telling you, I watched that in David Wilkerson's portray, uh, Pat Boone's portrayal of David Wilkerson lit a fire under me again. My God. This little plow boy had a vision to go to, the, to New York in the Bronx in Harlem 
and queens and preach Jesus and to the worst to the gangs. And Nicky Cruz was his main focus. You know what Nicky Cruz did to him the first time he preached Jesus to him? He smacked him in the face. You know what Nicky Cruz did the next time he preached Jesus to him? Smacked him in the face. You know what, you know what David Wilson did? He kept preaching Jesus to him. And you know what happened to Nicky Cruz? He got saved. Do you know what Nicky Cruz's life was? My God, he was raised in a Satanist home. His parents were devil worshippers. But my God, and his parents sent him to live in New York. New York's the second capital of Puerto Ricans. I don't know if you know that or not. That's where they always go, and then they come to Kentucky when they leave New York. Can you say amen? Why did everybody look on this side of the church when I said that? They, that's the second home for Puerto Ricans, New York. And there's where Nicky Cruz was. He, at 15, he started running the streets and became leader of the Mau Mau's or something like that. Nicky Cruz is still alive today. 60 years been preaching the gospel. He's still preaching to the gangs. He's still preaching to the youth. But what if, what if, but I'm going to tell you, somewhere along the line, David Wilson had a, a, a group of people that got with him and he heard this word from God. Why would you go there? I've heard that. Oh, God, I've heard that. Why would you do that? Why, why would you minister to those folks? I've heard that. Sadly to say, I've heard that. I'm convinced of one thing in my life, that every person deserves to hear about Jesus. In Acts chapter 13, the church there at Antioch was gathered together and they ministered unto the Lord. And they fasted. That's a dirty word to a lot of church folk anymore. Matter of fact, a lot of church folk don't like it so much they get translations where they took it out. Word fasting ain't even there no more. But they fasted. And the Holy Ghost said. We need the Holy Ghost to speak to us again. And your ministry direction is based on what God says. Not based on some kind of uh, church growth plan that you can order off Facebook or internet. Now, I'm not opposed to this thing. Don't misunderstand me. But God don't give you that direction to go. Stay away from it. Not every church is to be a mega church. Thank God for the churches that have still still got the twenties and the thirties. Still thank God for the church that got seven people show up faithfully. I'd rather have seven people show up faithfully than seven that show up and living in sin. Can you say amen? Yes, I just said that. When the church comes together in one accord, they'll set a sound doctrine in order. See, a church that's in discord, you've got doctrine all over the place. And see, well, now we have the Gentiles. We're moving on. We're moving through the book of Acts. Now the Gentiles got saved, and some of the, some of the converted Jews were saying, they've got to be circumcised. You've you got to cut them. And this was spreading through the church like wildfire. And you had Gentiles thinking, well, what do we do? Oh, you've got to get circumcised. When they'd already been told by the, by the council that came together, said, this is what you do. Don't eat anything strangled, don't eat blood, and abstain from fornication. And now they're coming in and saying, you've got to be circumcised. We don't know what to believe. But a church... In Acts 15 and 24, in verse 25, it said they were assembled together with one accord to send chosen men with our beloved Barnabas and Paul to straighten out this mess of this false doctrine that they had to be circumcised. When the church comes together, it will have direction and that set for sound doctrine. It's important for the church to be in one accord. And there's no way we can go through the whole book of Acts this morning, so we're going to stop here. We're going to stop right here. At chapter 16, we're about halfway through it. 
You ever heard of the two men by the name of Paul and Silas? You're talking about a ministry team. Well, they got themselves in a little fix. And uh, cost some folks some money. If you remember, there was a little woman following them around. Saying, these men show us, have come to us to show us the way into salvation. Well, that's right. You think, what's wrong with that? That's the truth. But the problem was, she had a spirit of divination. For you that know what that is, that's a, like a fortune teller, a soothsayer, a palm reader. Stay away from that mess. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If you operate in that, you ain't oper you're a puppet to the devil. And Peter, I'm sorry, but Paul got annoyed by this thing. After about three days, he turned and he looked at the Spirit and said, Come out of her! And those, she was a slave. And those that owned her, seeing the prophet, was gone. So they roughed Paul and Silas up. Caused a big uproar. Police was called in. They whipped them. They threw them in the jail and locked them. I mean, I mean, I mean, they was in the inner prison. Many believe that was the sewer. I don't doubt it. And they were locked, hand and feet. And they had one guard watching over them. And said, do not let these men leave. You make sure they stay here. And here they were. They were whipped. They were bloody. They were bruised. And Silas looked over at Paul and said, Well, you've done it now, Paul. You got us in a mess this time. I know I shouldn't have listened to you. I know you wasn't going in the direction God. I know this wasn't a God. If you know your Bible, that ain't how the story happened. I don't know who looked over at who. I don't know if Paul looked at Silas or Silas looked at Paul and said, uh, you know, let's just begin to pray. And let's begin to sing praises unto God. I don't know who was praying and I don't know who was singing. But I know this, Paul and Silas begin to pray and, and sing psalms at the middle at the midnight hour. And all of a sudden, an earthquake come. I'm telling you once again, when you can sing the songs together, when you can pray together, you better hear what I'm saying this morning, church. When you sing and you pray together, if you want earth moving services once again, it comes when you come together in agreement. And the Bible says an earthquake hit that hit that prison, and every man's bands were loosed. It just wasn't Paul and Silas, but every man in that prison was set free. I'm telling you, church, when we come together in one accord, ah, those that are bound will be set free. When demons, when you encounter people that are oppressed and obsessed and even possessed by devils, when the church is walking in the accord and the power of agreement, they have no choice but to back down and back off. But a devil walks into a bunch of mess, they sit and laugh at you. May I remind you of the seven sons of a seven? Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you? There's people in here, you've got bondages that need to be broken off you. I'm talking about church folk. Some of you like your bondages, though. I'm going to tell you, you wear them around like jewelry. Check out my bling. The only thing you need to be bound to as a believer is the Spirit of God. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang songs unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So I'm going to tell you something the church hears when we get in one accord. They can't hear discord. 
you got this group over here singing one thing. You got this group over here singing another song. And to the unbelievers and the bound, they don't hear nothing but confusion. But when you come together and you say, and I'm not, this is not, I'm not blanking on something about music here. I'm making a point. But when you come together and you're all saying the same things and singing the same songs, and then bondages begin to break. And they hear what you have to say. See, folks, we're a team. Not a team of equals. But a team of essentials. You're essential to the team. And every person on the team has a different function. And individually operating their function, they are defeated. But when every player plays in their function and to their full potential, you become a winning team. I don't care how good you are. I don't care if you wear Jordans. That don't make you play like Jordan. But you're an essential part of the team. You might be the one that brings Jordan his towel. I don't know. Cleans his jock strap. I don't know. But you're essential to the team. Can you say amen? What am I saying? In this upcoming year, you need to be accountable to somebody. Not somebody lord over you, but somebody that loves you enough to tell you, hey, you're out of line. You're out of step. You need to get that right. You, 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 don't need to, you don't need to go in that direction no more. See, a lot of people want to come to church. They like the idea of going to heaven. They dislike the idea of going to hell. But when it comes to this obedience stuff, hey, leave, leave that out. Just tell me how I get to heaven. Well, I did. Obedience. How do you get to hell? Disobedience. You need to become accountable. See, and, and Paul told the church at Corinth, which is so applicable for today. He said, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, have a lot of people telling you what you should do and how you should do it, yet you have not many fathers. For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul saw these folks at Corinth as his children. He fathered them. He corrected them. He scolded them when they needed it. And they didn't act like a bunch of spoiled brats and not receive it. They took it. You got all kinds of people telling you what you should do. But you need a father. Women, you need a mother. To be accountable to. And we even see that in the epistles. The older men are to teach the young men to be sober and grave. View them as brothers. The younger women are to be trained by the older women. To be keepers at home. To be chaste. And us men are to view them as sisters. When that lustful eye comes upon you, brother, view him as your sister. That's why that's in there. Amen. Good preaching, brother kid. See, some of the greatest ministers who've ever lived, they'll tell you that their development came through a mentor or a spiritual parent. See, we need fathers and mothers in the Lord. You need a prayer partner. You need someone to agree with you. James said this in chapter 5. 
chapter 5 says, where have the instructions or any, uh, is there any afflicted among you? Let them pray. Any merry among you? Let them sing. Is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. He gives the instruction what to do. Anoint them with oil. Call on the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall raise them up. They've committed any sin. It shall be forgiven them. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then he says this. He says, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. See, ladies, that's why you need to come. That's why you need to make a point to gather when these women gather. Because there's things you need to talk about that you can't share with your husband without causing a fight. And you need to be accountable to these one another. 